All right, so when we study the Cold War, one of the immediate, and, and when we study history in general, um, one of the immediate things we always think about is relevance. Um, to what extent is the history we're studying relevant to the world we live in today? Um, the, the whole like kind of mission of a historian, really, when it comes to, to writing, researching, teaching history, is to use the past as a lesson for understanding the present. And history, history can't solve the problems of the present, but it can inform the present, and it can inform your decisions. If you have a historical mind about the past, you understand the past, you can think historically, you're historically minded, then you can make more informed decisions in the present that hopefully result in um, optimal outcomes in the future. So we think about history when we study it, whether it is the ancient Greeks or whether it is um, the Middle Ages or the Renaissance or, of course, in this case, the Cold War in the 20th century, we're thinking about how history is relevant to the present day, how history has shaped the world today. So in this particular part of the lesson, I want us to take a look at some first, some current affairs issues of the 21st century, and then I want to kind of explain the historical roots of these um, of these issues. Senior U.S. officials arrived in Taiwan on Wednesday as China steps up what it calls combat drills around the island. Taiwan, a democratic self-governed island which Beijing claims as its own, has complained of heightened Chinese military activity in its periphery in recent months. 25 Chinese aircraft, including fighter jets and nuclear-capable bombers, entered Taiwan's air defense zone on Monday, the largest incursion Taipei has reported to date. Chinese spokesman Ma Xiaoguang defended the exercises on Wednesday, calling them a, quote, necessary action and a solemn response to external forces interference. He added that the exercises are, quote, sending a signal that our determination to curb Taiwan independence and Taiwan-U.S. collusion is not just talk. Meanwhile, emissaries from the U.S. are visiting the island in what a White House official called a personal signal of the Biden administration's commitment to Taiwan. They are due to meet Taiwan President Tsai Ing-wen on Thursday, who has repeatedly called Taiwan an independent country. Beijing was quick to condemn the meeting, with the spokesman, Ma, accusing the U.S. of, quote, playing the Taiwan card and continuing to send wrong signals to Taiwan independence forces. Ma further called the Taiwan independence cause a, quote, dead end, comparing it to the likes of drinking poison, which will only push Taiwan towards disaster. North Korea said Saturday that U.S. President Joe Biden's administration had taken the, quote, wrong first step in criticizing Pyongyang's latest missile test. North Korea said Friday it had launched a new type of short-range ballistic missile, its first such test in a year and since Biden took office. Biden on Thursday called the reported tests a violation of U.N. Security Council resolutions, but insisted that he remained open to diplomacy with Pyongyang. In a statement carried by state news agency KCNA on Saturday, top North Korean official Ri Pyeongchol ripped into Biden's, quote, thoughtless remarks, calling them an undisguised encroachment on our state's right to self-defense and a revelation of deep-seated hostility. Re added that, quote, we are by no means developing weapons to draw someone's attention or influence his policy, accusing the Biden administration of exploiting every opportunity to provoke Pyongyang by branding it as a security threat. Pyongyang's latest test came just days after a visit to South Korea by U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken, who vowed to work to denuclearize North Korea and criticized its, quote, systemic and widespread human rights abuses. North Korea has slammed the joint U.S. military exercises with South Korea, even though they were repeatedly scaled back to reopen denuclearization talks with Pyongyang. And on Saturday, Ri added that, quote, we know very well what we must do. We will continue to increase our most thoroughgoing and overwhelming military power. The White House, which has said it's in the final stages of reviewing its North Korea policy, declined to comment. Iran is ramping up uranium enrichment in response to what it says was Israeli sabotage at a nuclear facility. 
Tehran's chief nuclear negotiator Abbas Arakchi on Tuesday told state media the nation was adding centrifuges at the Natanz nuclear facility and would begin enriching fissile material up to 60% purity, a level above the 20% threshold seen as highly enriched and a large step towards weapons-grade uranium. We are going to add 1,000 more centrifuges uh, to, to Natanz facility. We would start from tomorrow. Enrichment up to 60 percent. Meeting with his Russian counterpart on Tuesday, Iran's foreign minister, Javad Zarif, hinted that Israel could face repercussions after an explosion on Sunday at the Natanz nuclear site. We will do our own investigations. If we conclude our investigations and Israel turns out to be responsible, then Israel will receive its response and it will see what idiocy it has committed. Rest assured that Iran's position after this action will be stronger both in the negotiations and in the nuclear future. On Monday, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu didn't comment on the alleged sabotage, but said Jerusalem would do everything in its power to stop Tehran from developing atomic weapons. I will never allow Iran to obtain the nuclear capability to carry out its genocidal goal of eliminating Israel. Iran's plan to up enrichment comes shortly before high-level talks in Vienna are set to resume, aimed at reviving a multinational 2015 nuclear deal that limited Iran's enrichment program in exchange for sanctions relief. Last week, Iran and the global powers held what they described as constructive talks to salvage the deal that all but collapsed after former President Donald Trump quit the pact, reimposed sanctions, and Iran breached limits on uranium enrichment. U.S. President Joe Biden has said Tehran must resume full compliance with restrictions on its nuclear activity under the deal before Washington can rejoin the pact. Guatemalan security forces on Monday cleared a road of hundreds of migrants in a caravan bound for the United States. After an intense standoff overnight, during which police used sticks to try to beat back the mostly Honduran migrant group. The clash Sunday night was the latest effort by Guatemalan authorities to break up the caravan, which officials said numbered close to 8,000 people within hours of its departure for the U.S. from Honduras last week. About 2,000 of the migrants installed themselves on the road after they clashed with Guatemalan security forces during a failed effort to make their way past. The Guatemalan government said groups of migrants looked for alternative routes after the clearance. It was unclear how many were turning back altogether. The migrants included families with young children. Many say they are fleeing poverty and lawlessness in a region rocked by the coronavirus pandemic and two hurricanes in November. The first migrant caravan of the year comes just days before the inauguration of U.S. President-elect Joe Biden, who promised to adopt a more humane approach to migration than outgoing President Donald Trump, who favored a hardline approach. Mexican President Andres Manuel López Obrador on Monday warned migrants not to try to enter countries by force and said he was in touch with both the outgoing and incoming U.S. administrations over the migrant caravan. Those issues in the video what we just looked at are all issues that are inherently connected to understanding um, the Cold War. Uh, many of those problems, not all of them, but many of those problems are inherently linked to developments uh, in the Cold War era. And particularly in many cases, particularly the Cold War as it developed in the 1950s. So after, of course, in 1949, you saw the Soviet Union de detonate an atomic bomb. Uh, you saw China fall to the communist forces of Mao Zedong. After that occurred 1950 and beyond became associated with an increasing expansion of u.s containment policy and a kind of movement of the cold war away from the center which originally in the 40s like the center of cold war concern was really europe it was berlin uh, that divided city in the heart of what was then occupied east germany it was centered around Turkey and Greece and the Marshall Plan and the Truman Doctrine. By 1950, particularly with events like the Korean War, following the Soviet atomic bomb, following the rise of Mao and the Communist Party in China, the Cold War really develops, or the containment policy, I should say, really develops as a global policy to contain communism throughout the world. It became a global sort of mission. 
And in a lot of respects, the struggles between the Soviet Union, its communist ally in China, uh, the United States, and its allies in countries like Great Britain very much extended to areas of the developing world. Oftentimes areas of the world that had formerly been or were emerging from the colonial period. So what we're going to talk about briefly in the slides to come, we're going to briefly talk about the Korean War, this ongoing struggle between China and Taiwan. We're also going to talk a little bit about the American-Vietnam War, which after the Second World War is the most destructive war the United States was ever involved in and still has ramifications for relations between the United States and Vietnam today. We're going to talk a little bit about the history of the U.S. and Iran in the 1950s and how that shapes the future. And we're going to talk a little bit about Central America and how American policy with Central America has established the, the foundations for some real significant long-term policies in Central America. So first of all, to discuss the Korean War. The Korean War, which is sometimes referred to in American history as the Forgotten War. Uh, the Korean War lasted for Americans upwards of some almost four years. Actually, four years. <laughs> almost exactly four years, actually. What had happened with Korea, and this is a destructive war. We're talking about for the United States... Something in the way of 38,000 Americans died in a pretty short period of time here. Uh, the death tolls of the Korean War for civilians and military on both sides is well over a million as well. So what had happened at the end of World War II, much in the way that you saw with Germany, Korea became divided as the controlling Japanese empire was defeated. Korea had been imperialized. It was effectively controlled by the Japanese Empire uh, for the first half of the 20th century. And when Japan was defeated, the North became influenced by the Soviet Union, communist forces, and the South became influenced by the United States and the non-communist forces, much in what you saw, of course, in Germany. Well, while Germany in 1949-1950 seemed to stabilize, you, you, you began to see a, a, what appeared to be more of a lasting divide between East and West Germany. In 1950, uh, at the encouragement of Stalin, the North Korean le leader Kim Il-sun launched an invasion of South Korea. And South Korea was led by Syngman Rhee. This invasion caught the United States and its South Korean allies off guard. And the United States and the South Koreans were pushed all the way back to this small area on the southern peninsula, called the so-called Pusan Perimeter, as you see right here. To make a long story short, that occurs in, in September, August of 1950, where they're kind of almost pushed off of the Korean Peninsula. Then Douglas MacArthur, the general who, in American history, you might remember studying with respects to the Battle of Anacostia Flats during the Great Depression. He's also, of course, Douglas MacArthur is famous for his fighting in the Philippines and Papua New Guinea during the Second World War. Douglas MacArthur comes in and launches a, a stunning counterattack where he lands American forces amphibiously. Well, United Nations, it's really a United Nations operation that is largely led by the United States um, and the South Koreans. Douglas MacArthur launches an amphibious by water landing here at Incheon. And it was not expected by the North Koreans. And under the leadership of MacArthur, the United States and its United Nations allies and the South Korean allies fight near Seoul, push down south, and ultimately push the North Koreans back, catching them by surprise, all the way up here to the frontier of China. At which point, the now brand new Chinese communist country becomes involved in the war, invading the uh, United States and South Korean United Nations efforts, attacking back with human wave assaults of huge numbers of troops. And to make a long story short, over the subsequent, uh, the subsequent years, the United States and its allies are pushed back to effectively the dividing line, which is today... Um, well, it was the dividing line more or less 
at the end of World War II, and it is the dividing line today at the 38th parallel. Herein you see the roots of the sort of tensions and animosities between North Korea, led today by Kim Jong-un, in the same lineage of Kim Il-sung. And in the South, you see the American sort of, uh, the American friendly, the American ally, the democratic state of South Korea, which is an ally of the United States. And it is here that we see this sort of intense diplomatic standoff that continues well into the 21st century with, of course, North Korea, a rather isolated country in the world with its only major ally being China. And of course, it increasingly advancing its aims with respects to the development of nuclear weapons. This, of course, is an overwhelming concern for not just South Korea, but other regional powers um, like Japan um, and other, uh, other countries regionally uh, near uh, the Korean Peninsula. So here we see the, the roots of that in, in incredibly difficult and complex issue in the 21st century, rooted in the Cold War and the divide between the United States and the forces of communism. You can imagine why the Korean War inspires American policymakers to, to think globally about the containment policy now. This caught them by surprise. In a way, what happened in Korea was sort of what their worst nightmare was in Germany. And they hadn't really been paying a lot of attention to Korea. And then it happened in Korea. And it really, along with you know the development of communist China, this event really encouraged American policymakers to think globally about the containment policy and to really have heightened concerns about what they saw as the aims of the forces of communism to push back and overrun areas of, uh, of democracy, capitalism, and American influence. What about... Taiwan. Well, the relationship between the United States and Taiwan and also, of course, mainland China is, is, a, is a long relationship that yet again, yet again, extends back to the Cold War. Taiwan, for years, was actually recognized by the United States as the government of China. And for many years, uh, Taiwan as asserted itself as the government of China, of China. Now, today, of course, Taiwan is increasingly, in the 21st century, increasingly asserting itself as an independent state. And Taiwan very much now, after some 70 years since the, uh, since the Chinese um, Communist Revolution of Mao Zedong, uh, Taiwan very much, the Taiwanese people are very much developing a unique national identity making them more uniquely Taiwanese in, in culture than Chinese. But this is an important thing to remember. The Chinese government of the People's Republic of China, Communist China, view Taiwan as a place of rebellion, a place that is rightfully part of China, and a place that, that the Chinese government must make part of mainland China again. The... Legacy here, the long history here, so in the 20th century, China fell into civil war. And it was fought between Chiang Kai-shek and the Kuomintang nationalists and the communist, China, uh, communist Chinese forces of Mao Zedong. After World War II, the communist forces pushed back, as the United States was really not focused on Asia, um, the communist forces pushed back Chiang Kai-shek and eventually defeated them. And the forces of Chiang Kai-shek took refuge on Taiwan and established themselves there, uh, at that time pledging eventually to come back and retake China. In the 1950s, the United States recognized Taiwan as the government of China. It continued to recognize the, go the government of Taiwan as the government of China until the late 1970s. And we saw immediate crises in the 1950s related to this, as China increasingly sought, communist China increasingly sought to incorporate Taiwan and associated islands back into mainland China. When Eisenhower became president, he began a policy. It was called his New Look, and it was a response to what was seen uh, with the Truman administration's policy. Uh, Truman administration's policy was very, very expensive. And uh, 
Eisenhower wanted to scale back defense expenditures a little bit. He was a Republican. He wanted to be more of a fiscal conservative. And Harry Truman had really lost uh, the presidency. Um, he, wasn't, he didn't even run for a second term as president, largely because of the controversy of the war in Korea. Following Douglas MacArthur's invasion, following the Incheon landing of North Korea, uh, when the United States was being pushed back, MacArthur had, you know, along with other individuals in the United States, made, made threats that effectively they should be more aggressive, that they should use atomic weapons. These types of things were implied. Harry Truman had rebuffed MacArthur. And Harry Truman had, had basically suggested that MacArthur was behaving insubordinately. Eventually, Truman had MacArthur removed from his general's rank during the Korean War. Well, anyway, to make a long story short, this really ruins Truman's career. President Eisenhower comes in, brings the Korean War to uh, an end, and begins his new look policy. The new look was basically centered on the idea of using the threat of nu nuclear retaliation, atomic weapons, and covert actions as a way of deterring communist aggression. And so in the 1950s, and this happens on multiple occasions, as the Chinese are making overtures towards the island of Taiwan, uh, shelling islands like these islands up here, which are claimed by Taiwan, but are located very close to the mainland of China, the United States increasingly asserted its place behind Taiwan and even threatened to use atomic weapons on China if necessary. It really displayed at the time the dangers of nuclear deterrence, which is the idea that the United States was now, under Eisenhower, in some cases, using the threat of atomic and nuclear attack as a way to prevent communists from taking action. The danger of that is if you threaten it and you don't do it, right, you, you, look, you look weak. And this created such a problem for the United States that the Secretary of State at the time, John Foster Dulles, at one point wished that these islands up here would sink into the ocean because the United States had created such a problem by making this threat uh, so overtly. And up here you see, by the way, a U.S. carrier, the USS Lexington, that was sent into the Taiwan Straits. At the time, this was called Formosa to, again, try to assert the United States' place with Taiwan. This is an example. Now, of course, there was no atomic nuclear exchange, and eventually this, this sort of conflict kind of went, it went into a lull for a period of time. And increasingly in the 21st century, you've seen a rising amount of tensions as an incredibly much more powerful China with nuclear weapons, with a large navy. Um, in terms of boats, they have more boats than the United States today. An advanced um, air force is now increasing pressures to bring Taiwan into uh, the People's Republic of China. And this is a huge issue for the United States. The United States is the closest partner to China, uh, to, to uh, I'm sorry, to Taiwan. And Taiwan is today a country that really represents a lot of the ideals of the United States. It is democratic. It is, uh, it was the uh, one of the first and most progressive Asian countries when it comes to embracing um, same-sex marriage and um, the LGBTQ community. Um, it is very much a sort of westernized liberal democracy. And it's threatened by a, an authoritarian state that, as we saw in the case of the Hong Kong protests, um, very much might repress Taiwan's uh, ability uh, to self-governance and to these types of, 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 of expressions and freedoms. And so this really um, makes this issue that much more significant for the United States. Taiwan is a vital ally in the region and sort of represents the ideals of the United States in many ways. Um, some security thinkers might argue that, um, that of all places you might consider fighting and defending, it would be Taiwan because of those reasons. But the roots of the crisis in the 21st century are again in the Cold War. Now, the Vietnam War, um, Vietnam today, uh, the United States has normalized relations with Vietnam, and so there's no grand crisis about a war with Vietnam. But Vietnam, of course, was a place where the United States and the French before them fought devastating conflicts during the Cold War. Vietnam was, and so this is the reason I want to speak about this, because the United States uh, became engaged in an incredibly violent and destructive war in Vietnam, Vietnam. 
resulted in 60,000 Americans dead, uh, well over a million Vietnamese dead, in an incredibly difficult and destructive war that yet again uh, was fought in the context of the Cold War and the containment policy. The history of the Vietnam War goes back to French colonialism. The French had colonized Vietnam in the late 1800s. This is a map here of what the French colonial territories looked like. French Indochina with Cambodia, Laos, and then Vietnam was broken into three pieces, Tonkin, Annam, and Cochin China. The French colonial empire was incredibly repressive, uh, to say the least, and it gave rise to nationalist um, figures, and nationalist movements that sought to gain independence for Vietnam. And the most preeminent leader was Ho Chi Minh, who was a communist, a communist who was actually an ally of the United States during the Second World War. Uh, the United States actually saved his life once. He, the United States helped to train some of the original Viet Cong guerrillas. They were called the Viet Minh at the time. And Ho Chi Minh provided important support for the United States when it came to fighting the Japanese in this region of the world during the Second World War. At the end of World War II, the French sought to recolonize Vietnam. The United States did not really want this to occur. Uh, the United States had given independence to the Philippines in 1946. It wanted European powers to, uh, to find a way to gain independence to these territories. But in the late 1940s, containment did not... Oops. In the late 1940s, containment did not yet extend to Vietnam. The United States was most focused and concerned about Europe. And so the United States really kind of grudgingly accepted uh, the French desire to recolonize Vietnam, and it would sort of allow them to do this if they thought it would make sort of overall um, France sort of stronger in Europe, because they were most concerned about France falling to communism in Europe. They were more concerned about that than they were about Vietnam, which uh, the American president barely had a policy on in 1946, despite the fact that Ho Chi Minh wished to be an ally of the United States. Despite being a communist, he wrote letters to President Harry Truman. But in the 1940s, uh, it was really about Europe in the Cold War. And so the United States sort of grudgingly decides that they will support France. Until the 1950s, with, again, the Soviet atomic bomb, China falling to communist forces of Mao Zedong, then the Korean War, suddenly, suddenly you saw what seemed like a massive spread of communism in the globe, and particularly in Asia. And this led the United States to then begin to fund and support France robustly in fighting Ho Chi Minh and the communists during the French Indochina War uh, in the 1950s, as we saw the Cold War sort of go global. Now, to make a long story short, the United States, France loses the French Indochina War. It's defeated at the Battle of Dien Bien Phu in 1954 in a, in a devastating colonial loss for France. The United States will enter into the sway to try to create a South Vietnamese government that might become independent and act as a place where which, con, where which communism could be contained. The United States did not want to colonize Vietnam but it feared this like domino-like spread of communism across Asia, and it drove the United States to intervene. It began to inter intervene by trying again to create an independent South Vietnam. It sent economic investment, development, advisors, military advisors to this new country that had many, many, many problems and was a long way from being anything that, 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 that looked democratic. But the United States believed by doing this, it could hopefully create a sort of American-friendly South Vietnam that could be used, like in Korea, as a sort of place to contain the spread of communism in Southeast Asia. The problems with the government, it was a repressive government, it doesn't garner national support, and by 1963, the president is assassinated in a coup, and the South Vietnamese government now, of course, John F. Kennedy dies in November 22, 1963 as well. And the South Vietnamese government was inevitably going to collapse. And this leads the United States under the then president, Lyndon Johnson, 
to take over fighting of this war. And from 1965 to 1973, American ground forces fought in Vietnam and also to some extent in, in Cambodia um, and Laos. And it was a long, destructive war. At the height of the war, these are American soldiers fighting in the, the, the famous Battle of the Ajrang Valley in 1965. Um, but it was a devastating war. America at one time had as many as over 500,000 soldiers in Vietnam fighting this war. It left 60,000 American dead, some 1 million Vietnamese dead. It opened the door for a massive genocide in Cambodia perpetrated by the Khmer Rouge. It resulted in mass social unrest and protest in the United States, um, and the ramifications of which are still shaping the United States today in many ways. And it also opened the door for economic problems in the United States today, uh, resulting for a number of economic issues in the 1970s um, um, as well. So it was a very, very devastating conflict, one in which the United States drafted Americans to fight, uh, one in which uh, the United States dropped more tons of bombs than in any other theater uh, of World War II combined in the Vietnam War. It was a war that, uh, you know, really, really, really um, shaped the way the United States sought to intervene in the future, how Americans viewed veterans. It, 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 it shaped the lives of people in Vietnam as well, um, as many, many, many refugees from this conflict ultimately came to the United States. Now, today, Vietnam remains a, a country ruled by a communist party, though its economics are capitalist. And the United States and Vietnam have a closer relationship today, but still to this day in the 21st century, the United States provides funds to the Vietnamese government as well as Cambodia and Laos to help get rid of unexploded bombs, landmines, and the like from uh, this region of the world that have remained as a result of the Vietnam War. Now, what about the Middle East? We saw that video on Iran. Uh, there's a history here, too. In the 1950s, Iran, which had been part of the greater British Empire, and this, of course, was sort of the, the heart, in many ways, of British Petroleum, BP, the, gas, the oil and gas company. Well, in the 1950s, the Iranians had more or less democratically elected um, a leader, Mosdegh, who was overthrown by the United States' Central Intelligence Agency and the British uh, secret, uh, secret Intelligence Agency in a coup in which they aligned with rivals to Mosdegh and backed this individual right here. And this is Mohammad Reza, or the Shah of Iran. Here, of course, is President Eisenhower, Dwight D. Eisenhower, the Supreme Allied Commander from World War II in Europe, and President of the United States in the 1950s. Eisenhower's new look was centered on one part on the threat of nuclear war, on nuclear deterrence to contain communism. It was also centered on using groups like the CIA to work behind the scenes to conduct um, alliances and coups with um, groups that were uh, um, fighting against leaders that were not popular in the interest of the United States. Now, this is the Cold War. So you might think this probably has something to do with the Cold War. So why did the United States do this? Why did they overthrow the Iranian government? Well, as you might expect, the reason was largely out of a concern over growing Soviet influence. The Soviet Union's right up here, all the way up here as well, of course. And Mossadegh was a socialist-leaning individual. He had threatened to, well, he didn't threaten, he did nationalize the oil industries in Iran. And this resulted in a, in a fear of a loss of British and U.S. economic and financial, as well as geopolitical interest in the region. There was a concern that the Soviet Union might spread down and, and then be strongly influencing this region of the world. It's not by chance, of course, that when you saw in that video at the beginning of this that the Iranians speaking in that video were flanked by the Russians. And Israel, when it spoke, the Israeli government, Israel is right down here, when it spoke, it was flanked by the United States. Two positions, the United States' association with Israel, Russia, and then the Soviet Union's ultimate association with Iran, 
which very much symbolizes some of the, the antagonisms of the Cold War. And here you see the location geographically of this in the world more broadly. Well, in 1979, Iran, there was a revolution, and it overthrew the Shah. This is the Shah, Mohammad Reza. He was an American-supported leader. He wanted to westernize Iran. But in the 1970s, the Iranian economy went down, his health went down, and it opened the door to an Iranian Islamist revolution, Islamic nationalism in Iran. And this overthrew the, the, the American-friendly government, and it created this long-term deterioration of U.S. and Iran relations, which, of course, in the 1980s and beyond, was associated with Iran's involvement in various types of militant and terrorist groups in the region, the response of the United States and its uh, Israeli allies in many cases. And, of course, today we see this very much at the heart of concerns with the Iranian aspirations potentially for a nuclear weapon and the Iran nuclear deal. So we see, again, these tensions, these animosities, these problems rooting back to the involvement of the Cold War. And in this case, the United States' involvement through the CIA and British secret service groups in a coup that ultimately overthrew the government of Iran and created a great deal of long-term animosity uh, between the two countries today. Last slide. Go to Central America. Now, Central America, the United States had a long-term involvement in Central America. It was basically this region of the world, while the United States did not take colonies here, this was a region of the world that was indirectly imperialized by the United States. Um, Nicaragua, which is right down here, was um, very much an indirect imperial territory of the United States. During the 20th century, Nicaragua had a dictator, and the dictator very much ruled, the Somoza family ruled at the behest largely of the interests of the United States and of the family's own self-interest. Result was massive poverty for the Nicaraguan people, and ultimately a revolution in Nicaragua that overthrew that government just about the same time that the Iranian government is being overthrown. You had U.S. imperialism in Cuba before Castro rises in the late 50s. And U.S. imperialism wasn't centered around taking colonies, but rather using political alliances, military alliances, and economic power to effectively control and influence these areas. And Guatemala was another example of this in the 1950s. Again, like Iran, right about the exact same time as the Iranian actions were taken by groups like the CIA, the Central Intelligence also organized a coup, an ouster of Jacobo Arbenz, pictured right here. The Guatemalan leader, again, he's an individual that's democratically elected, but has socialist leanings. And while there's some fears that maybe the Soviet Union might find its way into Guatemala, there were also bigger fears that a socialist-leaning country might effectively destroy long-term American business interests. It might nationalize the various business enterprises that exist in places like Guatemala, which will create, create economic problems for American interests in the region. Places like Nicaragua and these places in Central America were dominated by companies like United Fruit, that would grow things like bananas, and they would sell these to the United States despite the fact that their own populations were, uh, in some cases, on the verge of starvation. So we had a leader, democratically elected, but socialist-leaning, and the United States uses the CIA, the Central Intelligence Agency, to overthrow this government. The United States backs the rise of military leaders in Guatemala, and the result was a 36-year-long civil war. It doesn't end until 1996. And you could see this very much as directly related to other conflicts in the region connected to the long-term influence of American imperial power. The civil war, the brutal civil war in El Salvador that dominated the 1980s. The conflict, the revolution in Nicaragua and civil war in the late 1970s and the U.S. attempt to overthrow that government in the 1980s. These conflicts across the Americas and Central Americas, it really destabilized the region. It undermined governments, it damaged economies, and in many cases, it created the long-term ramifications 
for the huge inequalities, inequities, and problems in Central America today that result in things like um, the displacement of populations, of gang violence, and drug trafficking, and so forth. 